sweet. Look at this thing. It looks like it's working. Welcome to Vlog Thursday. Well, uh, start it over. Welcome to Vlog Thursday, episode 142. I forgot my water. So we are coming at you live here, and uh, I got toys in front of me. I've been really busy playing with stuff, really busy in vendor meetings, and uh, that's always just a pain. So uh, right here, let's talk about what I've got in front of me. Oh, this is tomorrow's video to review. It was supposed to be today's video, but then everything went wrong, and now it's not, so now it's tomorrow's. Uh, this is a NetGate SG5100. We really like this box, and it's one of them that has uh, somehow been not reviewed. So uh, this is also an unusual system because it was sent to us by NetGate. They've actually never, for free, mailed me a box. I've always bought all of them. So uh, there's two different things you may have just learned. Hey, look, it's my son. Don't smoke bees, Marcus. Don't smoke bees. There we go. There he goes that next to me, grab something related. This is also a NetGate box. We still have it. It still works. Uh, I haven't updated it in a while. I, I don't, I think it still has updates. I don't think it's reached end of life. I love the color, uh, but this is an obsolete box. So that is a, uh... <laughs> my son says time to bother me. Um, this was one of the first NetGate boxes. Might not be the first I reviewed, but among the first I reviewed. So uh, this is from quite a while ago. So that's that's kind of a neat thing. I'll leave that sitting there. But this one, one of the reasons we like the SG5100 and compared to some of the other boxes, I like the 7100. I, we've sold and installed quite a few of them, but the big but comes in all the time, right? The but is the fact that the SG7100 uh, and the 3100 and the 1100 all have that split VLAN. I have no problem with it. People have problems with it sometimes. I did a video specifically on there and I know it helped a lot of folks as it cleared up, you know, how it works. But this is a uh, challenge, of course, is making sure you understand how those work. Well, that's not a challenge in here. No split VLANs. These are one, two, three, four, five, six logical separate ports on this box. So uh, that's you know, makes this a little bit different. So the review is fun because every one of them is 100% gigabit, fully logical ports that you can do whatever you want with them. Uh, so we're going to do some videos around this. I also spent, um, I had a good call today with the PFSense people. We were talking about fine tuning of OpenVPN to get the most speed out of it. So that's actually going to be a second video. It's going to be somewhat related to this because I'll probably be using it for some speed tests, but it's also in general, something interesting to discuss is, you know, what are the trade-offs? Obviously we can use less crypto and get better speed, but there's a trade-off on there. So yes, this potentially someone could crack it, but the other side of that is you get more speed. But what's the potential? Someone would have to capture how much of your data and spend how many hours trying to brute force it. What are the theoretical? So yes, it would take them only 10 years of compute power to crack versus 50 years of compute power to crack, but will the data that you transported matter after 10 years? Or with the exponential speed by which computers get faster, maybe they cut it to five years, will that data matter in five years that they were able to extract, provided they sat on it for five years and found it worthwhile to spend five years trying to crack your data, whoever they are. So, yes, uh, some videos on FreeBSD and why OpenBSD would be cool for people, cool facts about them. Uh, Netflix and FreeBSD. Yeah, it might be fun. Um, I would rather have someone from the BSD Foundation do that with me. Uh, maybe I'll find someone that can do that. So that might be kind of cool. Uh, there is a lot of discussion. BSD is used heavily, not just for PFSense firewalls and FreeNAS, but in very high level corporate places due to the scalability that has been uh, built into the excuse me, the BSD platform for a very long time. So the BSD platform is very extensible and scalable and I mean, very scalable. The PF filter that is part of, uh, you know, the whole PF sense thing, that's, that is an amazing uh, Swiss army knife when it comes to, you know, uh, tools when it comes to network engineering. So a lot of big uh, ISPs have run this in the back end. Companies that need to do things to scale have uh, gone to BSD for a lot of different things. By the way, for, for those of you familiar with the concept of like Docker or any type of uh, containerized system in Linux, 
that's been around for a long time in the BSD world as well. That's referred to as jails or the re more recent one that they moved to with free NASA's IO cage, which is another form of jail. But that concept has been, you know, long rooted in the BSD world. So yeah, BSD is definitely pretty cool. So awesome. Yeah, I, I well, like I said, I'm finding maybe someone that's uh, in that particular community that does it. Um, so we'll start with break fix clients to MSP. And this this is just, this is part of the reason this morning got so busy, I didn't get as much done. Um, so we had a client that we, sorry, there's a mosquito in here. Uh, uh, we had a client who was given a proposal to get everything upgraded and we'll start here. So this is a good topic. Uh, they thought they just didn't want to spend the money. And allegedly they had a good IT company who, I, I, that's subjective, especially after now that we landed them more fully as a client. But how it starts is you give them a proposal. No, 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 I don't want to spend money recurring is what the customer said. So we just put them on, you know, call us if you need us. We'll bill you if you need it. You know, that's fine. So we started doing that. And um, how a, a calamity of errors is uh, basically what had happened. It's, um, I'm not smiling at other people's misfortune, but it is, it, it is a calamity of errors. <laughs> so the client, uh, something about a fire drill or the fire alarm goes off unclear if it was uh, intentional or a test of the system, but someone smelled smoke. When you smell smoke and you realize your servers aren't backed up in your office building, you go grab the server. So they grabbed the server. By grabbing the server, they learned that they could get the server out of the building and off very quickly, but then they couldn't get it turned back on. And that whole panic attack of the server won't turn back on jogged their memory to a proposal that we gave them and go, you know, <laughs> we should probably consider your uh, backup plan. So it, when, when people say like, hey, why don't you, why do you even take break fix clients, et cetera, et cetera. This is kind of the reason why is uh, we, we'll do all the break fix and maybe they never change. Maybe they just become a random person. We've got a, a law office that I can't believe how much they've spent. They would have saved money at, uh, for all the goofiness that they've spent on when it comes to doing all this uh, break fix work, but they just can't, you can't convince them. We even told them we'd give them a better rate if they uh, went to MSP. Nope, they just keep paying us and that's fine. Um, but sometimes you end up with these people who through a calamity of errors of grabbing your server and running it outside, there's gotta be at some point when you're thinking, and this is just me playing this and we have a sales meeting come up with them and I'm bringing it up. I mean, there's gotta be at some point when someone said, am I risking my life carrying a server out of here because the building might be on fire to try to save my data and how much should I really save? I mean, that's a, that's a real problem when you're going, hold on, I smell smoke, but grab that server. <laughs> I mean, what if you weren't there in the office and the server just goes? You, there's just too many scenarios that they're risking their business on um, with, with a very, like it would be expensive to rebuild the company without their data. So that's kind of a crazy thing there, so. <clears throat> Uh, what do you recommend for remote backups of XCP VMs? Whatever works for you. Uh, for me, I take snapshots of the VMs and you can send them off site. That's actually one really good way to do it. Uh, and if you want to back up, like using some type of backup utility without doing snapshots, I like, well, we're really, one of the videos I'm working on um, is we're, uh, we use a Cloudberry for some things, but we may be using Cloudberry for all the things in the near future. We're uh, doing a bunch of demos and setting it up and standing it up. I'm doing a video on the product. We're really liking everything that we've tested so far has worked well. Um, I just had a meeting with the Cloudberry team to make sure I understand the product, to give them some uh, feedback on some minor things, but it's really cool. I really, it's, it's different than some of the other backups I've used. Um, from the dashboard standpoint, but wow, does it work good. Like it's it's pretty impressive overall. Uh, so that's definitely something we're exploring. So Cloudberry, if you're looking for a tool to use to back them up, if not, um, with XCPNG, you can literally do Delta backups. I have an entire video on how to do backups as an orchestra. So that's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, do you get Ubiquity early access hardware? So, I don't, they haven't sent me anything in a while. And so I just haven't, I've been busy and didn't order anything. And I can't review things, even if I buy them out of the beta store, I can't review them until they become general release. That's against the terms and uh, conditions of their beta store. So uh, maybe I'll review it. I, I don't know it, nothing about it. We were talking about it today and nothing about it looked super exciting other than its form factor. 
I'll review it eventually. I mean, it's a cool product. I got nothing against it, um, but it it didn't. It wasn't like earth moving, unless I just didn't read the features deep enough to determine that. So, hey, Eric. I think he left. Uh, if any of my employees are watching, either close the doors or turn the AC off. <laughs> I hear the AC running, but I hear the doors open. Anyways. <laughs> uh, oh, the new Unify controller interface. Let's look at the Flex HD all together here. I seen it in the announcement. Like I said, it's something we actually had. Uh, Unify Flex HD. Well, figures, hold on, what's the p actual landing page? You know, Unify's SEO is always terrible. I mean, I guess it brings you to the store, maybe that's where you wanna go, but they don't have a link back to their product page. So here's this, but where's the product page? Well, I know where it is, but... So, UI.com, Unify, Wi-Fi, and it's not on this link here. Oh, or is it here? Here it is. It's on. It's on the mesh page. It looks like, or is it not? Nope. That's just the mesh. <laughs> so it's released, but it's not on their page. Actually, I got to go into my email. That's where I got it from. You can't have to see all my emails. So let me go to the emails here. Uh. Where's the announcement? There it is. Learn more. What new interface? I don't understand. This looks like the old interface. Why is someone saying it's new? What am I missing? Why is it, why, why does people, are people just running old outdated ones? This, this looks like the uh, same interface. I'm confused, people. Why do people think that's a new interface? Uh, I don't get it. So it doesn't, okay, maybe someone else, yeah. People don't update, that is for sure. If, if you could sum up uh, uh, hacking, it's called people don't update. <laughs> that would, just put that on there. Maybe, uh, maybe that's a shirt. It's a shirt that's coming. Maybe and Xavier will start selling shirts that people don't update. We're busy because people don't update. <laughs> yeah, but the Dream Machine Pro is a different box, but it's the same Unify software. So the Dream Machine Pro, um, I don't know that that's out yet, but that's it's, that's a new system, but it's not a new interface. It's just a new offering from Unify. Unless I'm wrong. If someone can prove me wrong, I'm fine with being proved wrong. I. Uh, eh, whatever. Hold on, let me open up that link again. So what does it say here? Is the Dream Machine Pro on here? No. All right, I'm done babbling about this because there's nothing. Is it under remote management? Why? It's not on their site. It, they, they, so, so here is back to the problem with Unify right now. I mean, I get it, cool. Uh, control it from the Unified Dream. I mean, here's they talk about the Unified Dream Machine, but it's not on their site yet, so. It's added to the Early Access Store, which I'm not gonna go there. So see, it's in Early Access, but it's not. But here, there, <coughs> it's in the forums, <coughs> sorry. So, I don't know, moving on from that. <coughs> Sorry. Ugh. Anyways, so the Dream Machine is listed in that article, so it must be under close. Yeah, it says Dream Machine Pro. It's, I know it's a new thing coming out, so. Um, AMD load balance, flex review. 
So is it a load balancing router? You can do load balancing on the SG1500, that's for sure. It will do load balancing. But anyways, just to end the conversation on the brake fix though, this is a common, so to speak, strategy. We, it, it's actually kind of funny, we landed a client that uh, only brake fix that later did switch, but one of the reasons we landed them was funny. They said we called three other IT companies, they only do contract for one year. And, they, and I said, yeah, and they, uh, the client didn't like that. And I said, obviously the, the problem right away with contract with one year is if we don't know you very well, don't we want to try before we buy, blah, blah, blah. You make a lot of guarantees, but are you good at your job? They don't know. Are you responsive? The client doesn't know. Um, that's one of the other reasons we keep some of these break fix clients. Once they get used to us and they realize, hey, there's some cost savings and the, these guys are responsive already, cool. We can now talk about a full protection package and they can offer more services. So uh, that, it's a lot of why we do it that way. The the concept that we should only force people into long contracts, that's good for the bottom line, but at some point you just look greedy. And uh, that maybe that's your market is companies that are just ready to switch. But a lot of times, one of the things we see a lot of is companies that are so happy to get rid of their previous MSP because they didn't. They were in a contract, they talked to a lawyer, they said, it's hard to get out of this contract, we hate the people. They do just enough. They're on the edge of the SLA all day long. Like they never do anything more than just keep themselves out of legal trouble which of course means they're not doing a great job. So they're not ready to sign a contract with another company right away because they've already been burned by the first company. Even though you're not that same company, that kind of bleeds over like all you IT guys are shady and just have to charge us money. So it's definitely... Oh look, someone just got banned. So let's report uh, and get rid of this person. And dropping the band hammer. Yep, that person's gone. <clears throat> Whoever they were, they are now no longer with us. They have been banned with the band hammer. Why someone would choose to come in here and drop profanity, I don't know. That's okay. They're gone now. I don't get it. So let me see here. Oh, look, they, oh, they're, they actually have, uh, they've been, huh, that's interesting. All right, I want to see what I just found out. Anyways. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, uh, anyways, back to this. Thank you, Bill Duttery, $20 donation. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All that stuff helps out the channel. Uh, you notice that we did pick up a couple sponsors, uh, IT Pro TV. Uh, check them out. We've been really happy with them. I got to do a video review of them. I'm going to do some interviews with the uh, people from there. I was on their podcast, TechNado. Uh, by the way, that podcast is actually really good. I'm not just saying it because I was on it, but I've actually started listening to, added it to my tech list of podcasts. Someone asked me that last time. And... Uh, I actually had not heard of it before IT Pro TV until I started digging in to their social media and things like that. The, uh, you know, I, I, I was like, huh, this is new. And uh, they got a good group of people. They got a good set of articles they covered and they're very knowledgeable on the topics. So I thought it was good. And being a guest on there was definitely great. So, oh, awesome. I see people showing some how they got hack love. That's definitely awesome. Ah. Uh. So we've been definitely uh, expanding on how they got hacked. <clears throat> uh, but that's all I got to say about the break fix. Now, the other things that happened, employee changes. I figured I'll adjust these in a vlog. You're going to see changes. You may have already seen changes if you actually watch the shifting of our website. Um, Melissa went to go work for another company. She's been my web developer and friend of mine for over 10 years. And uh, she now got a job somewhere else. And I'm fine with this, by the way. It was a complete, she talked to me about it, put her notice in, we worked it out. Matter of fact, uh, she was doing a lot of the web development and we're working out a deal. I met the owner of the company. This is where you turn things around, so to speak. I don't get mad like, oh no, you can't leave, blah, 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 or make a bad exit. Instead, I've realized working with her new boss because Melissa focused on web development. Web development's never been our focus, it's been our side project is the best way to describe it. And Melissa, she's been with me for years. Back when she needed a part-time job, it worked out. We never really 
made it a huge part of my business. So it's always been like something aside Melissa did, but it wasn't massive amount of revenue that was generated from or massive amount of clients. It's something we did for a lot of our existing clients. Roll that forward to what we're doing now. Uh, we actually worked out a deal for, for all the clients we currently have to move over to that company and get taken care of. So we're actually working a deal out with me and her uh, new boss, the owner of that company, worked out a deal so he has access to my clients and uh, everybody wins. It's one of those things like making that change in a company not as big of a deal as you might think. And also, instead of making it awkward and painful, and she's like, you know, you know, if you want, it might be a conflict of interest, but I worked on a side. I said, don't work on a side. Get me your boss's email address of the new place. I bet that we have something we can work out together. So we um, turn that around. Hey guys, can you close the front door? Yeah. Yeah, because I hear the AC on and the door's open. <clears throat> but so it's uh, one of those things, like if you turn it around that way and we work out a deal, like, hey, would you like to take all these clients and we'll hand them off a transition. I already like working with Melissa. He's of course wants more business. He's busy and hired Melissa because he needed more developers and their focus is only doing web development. So we're gonna announce a partnership between them. We're gonna uh, work out a, you know, a system by which, you know, he'll even maybe send some IT jobs my way, but I'm gonna be sending web jobs their way uh, with a kickback for passing over the clients. Away we go, everybody wins. So that's definitely a, uh, a good way to go. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. What do you use in your Linux desktops? Remotely control your clients' desktops. Looking for something, hopefully web-based console. Let me control from Mac OS, Windows. We use uh, ConnectWise Control. Ah, uh, energy management matters. I don't want to be sitting in the dark like those folks in California. Not that that's related to energy management. It's actually a whole nother political power play BS stuff, but whatever. Uh, how do you contribute to the whiskey fund? You can donate money here and I will make sure it gets forwarded on to the folks at How They Got Hacked Tomorrow. Uh, it's all filmed in the same studio for those that don't know. So absolutely. <laughs> uh... Let's see what I get. So, all right, that helps. Cool. All right. Anyways, back to the employee thing. Now, the other change that happened this is directly related to the other employee change. Uh, I decided we are busy enough. I needed help with some of the business management side of things and some of the follow-up on sales things and process oriented. And you've seen Brett around here before. I've hired him to help with things in the past. Now we hired him full time uh, because we have some bigger plans that we're working on business related. And uh, at the rate that the leads come in, I need someone to help process all the leads. And we're getting uh, local leads still keep coming in. So Brett's following up with a lot of local infrastructure builds and leads related to that. Uh, so that is going to be all coming in play. You're actually going to see Brett in a bunch of videos as well. So me and him are going to work together on more training videos related to sales and process that will be uh, coming along. I'm sitting on a cord and it's got my, all right, it's tangled. There we go. So that's uh, all up and coming that's going to be on here. So with all the with all those changes, uh, you'll see, hopefully if it all works out right, I'll be making more videos because the, the goal is to offload a big part of what I do. So I'm the one who follows up on a lot of the process and related to like structuring things when it comes to the bids. Uh, so we've spent this week, uh, the last few days, training Brett on exactly how we do the bids, making sure he understands the process. And so far, I think he's quoted almost $15,000 in sales in the first couple days he was here. So it's, it's working out well um, and putting these quotes together. And we're gonna make videos on the process, uh, but we have requests that exceed my ability to fulfill when it comes to like sales coaching and training and some of that. And Brett is a specialist in that field. Matter of fact, uh, interesting side note, Brett sold insurance for a long time for some very large companies, me make AAA. Um, and you're kind of selling, although it's a different product, the concept is the same when you sell MSP, you're selling insurance. Uh, so he's going to be putting together and redoing some of the materials for that and you know, bringing his perspective uh, from working in an outside market to working in this market. So it's gonna be kind of interesting to see how he works in there. Uh, RMM platform is uh, SolarWinds, we're still using it. SolarWinds has been the, there. 
Oh, I know. I might, hopefully this weekend, I'll have all my thoughts on V10. So V10 with the Tesla is awesome. I've been wanting to make, uh, I have someone who sent me one of the, uh, a thing for my Tesla that I told him I'd do a video on like two weeks ago. And I said, and I told him, I said, it might be a couple weeks because the priority is to get some of these firewall videos done. The other priority is looking at backups. So I'm going to not only, I'm see, Here's the secret sauce of why Tom's videos are so random. And I've told someone else this that tried to pay me to do a product review. I don't do paid product reviews. And the reason my videos have a random cadence to them in terms of what's there, I'm actually just recording what I'm doing. Um, I turn it into a video. I remove client names from it, for example, but I'm recording what I'm doing. So I'm working on replacing all of our backups to Cloudberry. That also means I'm making a video on how to do it as an explainer. That explainer becomes part of things you may enjoy watching. That explainer also becomes something my staff may watch. When you see me doing a series of HA videos, that is because I did a whole bunch of HA firewall setups, actually two in the same week. And I said, hey, why not do a video on what I'm doing? The firewalls you've seen in the video where I was doing the HA were firewalls that actually went somewhere programmed in HA. So that's uh, the Tesla videos because uh, I want to do them all the time, uh, but I also sometimes don't want to work 80 hours a week. So that's what stopped me from making some of the Tesla videos. They're coming. What I want to do with the Tesla videos is make them a little bit better on the editing. Like my, my uh, intro, my very first impressions of Tesla, that took more editing time because I stitched together a few extra video clips in one. It's not like this. This is easy. Press record either live or not live and push out the video. This requires very little of my time to edit. That's actually the fact when I do a review because I can switch camera angles like this on the fly and go back and forth, this is, my editing becomes very simple to do a firewall review or something like that. So those videos get rocked out really quick, but the videos that require more editing like wandering around with cameras, that takes more time to put together in post-production. Therefore, I don't do them as often unless I have time to do them. And it's been really hectic lately. Business is really well, is doing really well for us, uh, but that it comes at the expense of my time being sucked up with all the really well that we're doing. <laughs> That's why we also hired Brett. By the way, Brett ain't cheap. So this is also one of those things. I can't just let Brett wander around. He has to completely compensate for the amount of money it costs to hire a Brett. Therefore, he has to get hustling on bids and I have to make sure he's clear, concise, and trained on exactly our processes. And that's how business works. Matter of fact, I've said this many times in other vlogs, business is so much like just a resource management game. Any of those real-time strategies that become some type of resource management, that's all business really is. I think the skills you may learn playing those games are really directly relatable to the skills you'll need to manage your money and output going, okay, you know, we can re-increase productions, but it's going to come at the cost of having another machine in here, another person who then processes this, but then our yield gets bigger once we gather more of this. Yeah, that's business. <laughs> um, the Cloudberry MSP uh, backup system, like their whole the whole thing. See, we manage too many people to just, we use Cloudberry already. We, the product works great. Like I did a review of the standalone. This is still the standalone tool, cloud managed. So that's specifically the cloud management. We, as a standalone tool, Cloudberry is great. Like if you just want to buy a one-time purchase, buy a piece of software that backs up a system, Cloudberry, great, great, easy solution. No problem. No brainer. Works awesome. But if you go a step further and go, I want a in-depth way to manage backups across lots of clients, well, that's what we do, then you need something like their dashboard to manage all those clients. What we're running into is Cloudberry is not like other backup platforms because Cloudberry actually offers uh, huge amounts of flexibility. They're not in the storage game. They let you pick whatever storage works for you. So when you have clients with one-off scenarios, you can have a Cloudberry solution that manage it. Matter of fact, you can use the MSP360 dashboard to control a series of local backups, even between data centers. So you don't even have to choose a cloud provider. Maybe the client has a system where they want it managed between geo geographically uh, different sites. So they have two different sites in two different states and they want to crisscross the backups between the sites. But you still want to manage it in a dashboard. Cloudberry's got a solution for that. That's the kind of neat things they do. So I thought that was really cool. Woohoo, $10 for the whiskey fund. Um, I think Xavier mentioned this, so I'm going to go ahead and get the uh, Japanese whiskey. I purchased some of that for home, and after purchasing it, I'm bringing some here. So, uh, Xavier, if you're still listening, 
Japanese whiskey tomorrow. Uh, let's see. Um, Tom, do you want to throw Linux uh, on my XPS 15 and run some benchmarks instead? Uh, you want to throw Linux on it? I will. How about you throw Linux on it? <laughs> um, oh, I, do I want to do it? I, I'm not big. I'm not a big benchmarker. Uh, lies, damn lies, and benchmarks. So, yeah, I. I don't know. I guess I could if you wanted to bring it to me. I guess I could review Linux on it. Um, but I already know the Dell XPS 15 run Linux fine. Uh, that's that they're common. They, matter of fact, Dell opened up. If you go, I think it's dell.com slash Linux. We covered this in the Sunday morning link. Sure, let me make sure that's the right link. <clears throat> Let's go there. Let's go there together. www.dell, <clears throat> not Dell, dell.com slash Linux. Whoops. Oh, okay, cool. I know who it is. I know who you are now. Yeah, dell.com slash Linux brings you here. And uh, from here, <clears throat> you're able to uh, get them. So they do run Linux great. They have a huge, actually a lot of Dells run Linux. Uh, what this does is basically filter Dell's site really quickly for a lot of Linux boxes. So kind of cool that Dell's got that as an offering now. I really like that. Uh, definitely pretty cool. So if you want a Dell that runs Linux, away you go. Uh, have you ever used a Unified APEDU speaker as a SIP endpoint? N nope, never touched it. Uh, not much interest in the product. I don't know. Is that a is that still a valid product? I don't think it's been refreshed in a long time. I think it's like an older 2.4 only. I could be wrong. I haven't looked at it. It's it's kind of novel, but I don't know if it works actually as a normal SIP endpoint. As far as I know, it's like broadcast only, and that's what it's made for. So you can basically attached to it and work it. it the idea of it is what the EDU name is, is for a school, and you could then broadcast out from there uh, to as if it's a school. Like, I want to broadcast to all my Wi-Fi access points so to get the voice out. Someone says, could you recommend a firewall currently in PFSense? Why would you change from PFSense? Uh, I like PFSense firewalls, so... I run a single PFSense firewalls, uh, so I guess I don't know your question exactly. So one firewall is adequate if you set it up right. Uh, do you already know if PFSense will be able to filter? No, you can't filter. Well, you if you're using DOH, if you use DOH, <clears throat> um, you will end up with a problem uh, because you have to point the DOH at the PF sense. If you don't point at the PF sense, it can't. You're, if you're bypassing and going external DNS, then, well, you're going external DNS. Therefore, it's not going to have any DNS control. So, woohoo! More money for the whiskey fund. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I need more water for sure. I think I got it. I got enough left. I have talked a lot today and I didn't even do a video. It's just all the meetings I had. So I'm actually getting there. <clears throat> have I tried the Eero Wi-Fi system? No, I haven't. I don't usually do it. Uh, I, I don't play much with consumer stuff. I don't care enough. Um, I'll just be honest. I would have no, I only review things that I'm working on or I have a passion for. If not, I'd be like, uh, product, product, I don't care about, uh, buy it or something. I don't know. You know, I, it's my, my enthusiasm is directly tied to whether or not I like the product. So, uh, I don't usually review too many consumer things unless it's something I really like. I, I like this flashlight a lot. I don't know if it's a consumer product or not, but, and this thing is. That looks cool in the lens. Anyways, <clears throat> like I like this flashlight. I actually have a review of this flashlight. And I have my bag here, my little laptop carry kit. I actually didn't edit this video yet, but I did a video about what I carry with me and what, what fun things you can find in Tom's laptop bag. And um, one of them's this. So I will review, you know, non, well not, I think this is still a tech item. I think this should be in everybody's laptop bag and shows to this flashlight. I think this flashlight's something really handy that does stay in my laptop bag. So I will review products 
pseudo tech related or non-professional, however you want to look at it, but it's generally not something like a consumer product because I'm not using it. I'm not deploying that at any clients or even my own home. Therefore, I think the arrow, what I've heard is it works really good. I've heard people tell me it works good. I have no other than hearsay and people saying I set it up and there were people who weren't very technical savvy that set it up and seemed to be happy with the product, thumbs up. So you're not likely to get much of a review out of it for me. Uh, what laptop do you suggest for the cheapest workstation laptop for Linux? I don't know that I will, I, you know, I did replace my X250, but that X250 is going on eBay. The uh, Lenovo X250 that I had, out of the box runs Linux fine, no special tuning, like a very standard install of Ubuntu works fine with no anything special. And you can find that for a few hundred dollars. So uh, I'm gonna say that's a cheap one, I, but saying cheap workstation doesn't help. I start with what's the use case and then we build around uh, what you want. So what's the use case? You know, do you need something faster? Do you need a 1920, 1080 screen? Do you, are those things, you gotta check those boxes first. What are you gonna run on it? Uh, do you need something that is fast enough to run XYZ? Well, that's what matters. That's how you determine what workstation. Just saying cheap workstation doesn't really help. Oh, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Do you have any experience with a Cisco call manager? And if so, what would be the best way to learn it? Uh, no, I don't. I don't care much for the Cisco call manager. I remember looking at it, it looked confusing. I've never actually worked on it. We just replaced one. It's the, only re the reason I know anything about it more recently is because we just replaced one with a free PBX system and the customer is exponentially happier. Um, and the customer is tech savvy, therefore there's someone who knows um, they like this whole platform better moving them free PBX. I didn't have much experience with the call manager. I just looked at it to get some information out of it, uh, but they moved over to free PBX and it was a successful fun project. Uh, Linus, Linus will reach out to me when I'm big enough, maybe. I don't know. I, I don't, Linus reviews a lot of consumer hardware. I don't, but I did see he reached out to and talked to the guys that serve the home when he built something. I'm all open for doing a collaboration with Linus. I think that'd be awesome. Uh, I, I, you know, pretty cool. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, when it, Linux, would you install on a T480 Pop OS? Yep. That's the easy answer. Pop OS. I love, I'm running Pop OS right now. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? When you say workstation, are you referring to something uh, heavy rendering or CAD software? Yeah, that's th those are all the questions you have to ask. So that's a good discussion to have in my, uh, in my forums as well. Have you placed fiber store switches and access point? No. I don't understand the question maybe though. Uh, could you make a video about how to prevent DOH Chrome Firefox? I will ask browsers enable DOH by default. Uh, you block it. You block everywhere that supports DOH. You got to get a giant list and uh, block that list. That's how you're going to do it. So you're going to have to block Cloudflare, block um, who else supports it? Cloudflare. I think Quad9 supports it. I think Google supports it. So you're going to have to block Google. You're going to have to block them. So that's how you're going to handle it. Um, for those of you wondering, so if you want to stop the DOH movement, that's how you do it. Uh, I don't think Grandstream is built on free PBX. Grandstream is their own thing. It's, a, it's not a bad platform, but it's not free PBX to my knowledge. CenturyLink Fiber. Uh, CenturyLink's an awful company. I have no idea if their fiber is good, but they're a terrible company. Any suggestions for backing up two uh, free and boxes, both remote locations? Cloudberry, again, I'll throw out there for, for general answer. <laughs> you do a lot of internet sales and PC repair. Uh, okay, whatever surfs the web. My X250 surfed the web fine, so I guess that's a good workstation. Free NAS, free NAS is awesome. Any idea uh, for rules for set for Snort? I have a video on tuning Siricata, but they kind of apply to Snort because they both use the same rule sets for the most part, so. 
Uh, you, you'd love to go for free PBX, but you want support. Well, that's why you can buy from Sangoma, who sells support contracts with their Sangoma PBX, which is free PBX with support. That's all it is. They sell support contracts for it. You can buy all the different levels of support. So, um, and I've heard people like 3CX. I've never tried it. I've heard it works. People sell it. It seems to work. 3CX is the same thing. They sell support with theirs as well. Uh, the nice thing about the Sangoma one, because all they're doing is packaging three, uh, free PBX and putting support on top of it. If you are if you Google something, you'll find the answer for it frequently because the free PBX answer is also the answer of the Sangoma product. I mean, I like this. I'm using an L480. I just reviewed this one. This, this laptop was like $800. I don't know where your budget is. Cheap is a real relative term. I think this laptop replaced my X250 because it's a lot faster. I have a review of this one here. So I don't know what cheap is. Cheap is a word, not a number, not a hard number for what you want or what your budget is. Recommendation for mini PC for a firewall to not throttle at one gig internet? Um, no. I tell people a lot of times, the SG3100, unless you're buying some used computer, even a used cheap computer with a Celeron in it will do one gig. Uh, it doesn't take much to get one gig of throughput. That's pretty much it. But uh, you'll spend more on electricity because it's going to use like 80, 90 watts of power versus an SG3100 will do one gig on like, I don't know, 10 or 20 watts. Uh, so you'll save in power and it's like 350 bucks for a box that will route at gigabit without going, well, I can buy this computer for 200 and deal with problems with it. I mean, if you have a used computer laying around, awesome. Uh, I, I watched my Getting Started PF Sense video. I'm using like a five-year-old processor, or actually, because that video is from last year, it's going to be a six or seven-year-old processor that works perfectly fine at one gig connections. It doesn't really take much to route. Routing isn't what takes the uh, up the pro uh, takes it up, so. Yeah, someone said, Sangoma also has commercial add-ons, uh, features that you can buy that are add-ons to free PBX that come with the licenses. I am running an L4, I have a video on this. Type in uh, Lenovo L480, there's a video on this. How to back them up? Use rsync. I don't know what on RAID has, but rsync's built into, um, free NAS. So try our sync, try sync thing. I just did a video on sync thing. Both of those work. I know sync thing supported on RAID. I don't know how our sync is. I'm assuming it is because it's Linux based. I don't use on RAID, so I don't know. I know there's a guy that has a bunch of on RAID videos. Oh, let's see. Hopefully that helps. Sarah Steinbreaker. Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah, Space Invader. Space Invader 1, I think, is what his channel is called. But he's got a lot of videos on Unraid. I mean, I I looked at it. Nothing about Unraid was compelling to me. It's a neat product. I don't think it's a bad product, but there's nothing about it that made me go, oh, I like it that much more than FreeNAS. Uh, I love ZFS. I love the way FreeNAS handles things on ZFS. It's ultra reliable. It's super solid. Therefore, I use it. Works works great. So... Yeah, it's all Docker and containers. Uh, I know it does Docker versus the BSD jail system that's used over on uh, there. BSD jail system is mature, but you know the Docker containers are not a bad way to go uh, if you want. You know, whatever floats your boat is why I tell people like if that's what you want to use, it's not a bad product. Um, I know they have all, I know Linus made it really popular because he had all kinds of fine tuning he had to do to it because he was trying to maximize performance out of it. And he had trouble with the free NAS for whatever reason, which is weird because his latest video was based on free NAS instead of Unraid. I know when he did the serve the home video, but I mean, eh, whatever works for you, whatever fits your use case. Uh, people keep saying Open Media Vault has ZFS. It does not have ZFS. It's not. If it has it, it's not anywhere in their documentation. I've not loaded it to disprove you, but I have looked through their documentation, and last time I looked, Open Media Vault does not have ZFS support. So, 
You know, I don't, this comes up constantly. People keep asking what we're doing for uh, replacing Unify Video. I've mentioned it in the comments. Look on my channel. If you even type in Unify Video, it says we're moving to Synology. I have like three or four videos on Synology Video now. <laughs> so, yes. Uh... So pretty much Synology is what we're doing for the uh, as a replacement for them. I have type in Synology video. I've got like I guess in a bunch of uh, videos on her. I don't, you know, I did that rant video recently. I guess I'd call it a rant. It's as close as I really come to ranting. I'm not really a ranty person, but the Unify video situation. I guess we're removing it now, and maybe I'll do a follow up video. But basically, the uh, Unify made the decision to throw an advertisement. So all the clients we updated to the latest version of Unify Video that we're still supporting those clients because we did those big jobs where you sold 40, 50, 60 cameras at places are now being prompted to buy a Unify Protect, but the Unify Protect won't even support that many cameras. So now my clients have to click through an ad after the update on every new computer they logged into to let them know that there's a different product out there. It's like, I don't know. But I guess some people, I, I didn't, I, I was being honest when I said there's not been that many phone calls. That's because people are so used to being advertised to. I think they close the ad without even reading it. <laughs> so uh, can't, uh, Synology camera support, I don't know. They have about 4,000 different cameras they support, maybe 5,000. It's pretty big. There's, their camera support's crazy. They, they support like pretty much all the cameras. So that's pretty cool. Um, isn't Shinobi a way to go with MVR? No. No, it's, it's a project that is slowly coming along and clearly not... Re we played with it. It's neat, um, but not... An, I didn't make a video on it. One of my staff, a couple of my staff played with it. It's a cool product. It's I, I wouldn't install it for more than a hobby right now. Uh, it might be a fun hobby to play with. It certainly isn't going to be the product we install for a client. It's far, far away from support there. Um, check out Blue Iris. I've... We've only done a couple Blue Iris ones. I just kind of found them a resource hog, and it runs on Windows. So if you don't mind running something on Windows, go ahead, run Blue Iris. Uh, the Synology, to me, just had a better setup because you're building it on top of the box with the RAID all in it and all the extra management features that come with the Synology. By the way, it's also still a Synology if you wanted to use it for something else. So if you wanted to make it their NVR and where they store some files, it's still a Synology with all the Synology features. It's not just an NVR. It is NVR is an add-on to the RAID box. Now, I really wish there was some awesome software I could load on a FreeNAS box that would make cameras magically work. I, that would be awesome. Maybe someday someone will write something, but it doesn't exist. So if it does, I'm not aware of it. Not that works good. I know there's all these other projects out there, but none of them work that well. And especially when you look at the features you get with a Synology, just some a whole lot better. So DW Spectrum. I'll look that one up. I may have looked at that one too. Now, I get it. Now, if you look at... Uh, oh, that's a, yeah, Digital Watchdog. Yeah. Digital Watchdog's not... I, I, I've talked to a couple people. I have not used it myself, and I'll bring this up because it's some DW Spectrum is by Digital Watchdog. Uh, we use this, and I'll also pull up this company. Exact Vision. So uh, both of these will run on Linux hardware, so you've got to build your own hardware. Uh, we do install some of these boxes as well. So Exact Vision. I know another company that really likes the Digital Watchdog. They told me these are really good. Um, I don't know the prices, and that's any one thing about these is, you know, everything's contact us, partner integration program, schedule a demo, find a reseller. I hate the fact that all their pricing is a secret. And um, Exact Vision, I think... Uh, Yep, they don't publish their prices here. I know the Exact Vision price is because we have a, we manage installs on Exact Vision uh, for some big clients. So Exact Vision is nice, and so is uh, Digital Watchdog, but they're not free either. So, um, yeah, the I so one thing about Exact Vision, their software is not a resource hog. I mean, I. I don't know the number right now, but it's big. Like, I think we have 300 cameras at a school we manage with. It's a big number. Um, there's a lot of them. So it's 
it's definitely a uh, something to think about <clears throat> uh, if you're a winer. But though there, it has a license fee. So uh, the license fee is like you're around one hundred and thirty dollars per camera plus some other license fees. So when you talk about three hundred cameras times a hundred and thirty dollar license fee, get a calculator out and you'll see you're gonna spend some money on licenses, and that's just the license, not the camera. Uh, have you done any analog to IP conversion using encoder? I have a video on that where we tested one. I think I did a video on it. Yeah, I did. It, it's it's kind of a, a hacky, it doesn't feel perfect, but it does work. So how's that? Uh, Dwayne asks who my Solar Winds rep is. Uh, fill out the contact form on our website and I'll email you that information. Because I don't, I don't remember. I, I would say his name out loud. It's not a secret if I could remember his name. <laughs> I don't talk to him very much. I, I talk to him every, every few months. Uh, Chinese surveillance cams are not exactly banned. That's kind of a fuzzy. They're not supposed to be put in government places. By the way, all the, all the cams are made in China except for, well, they're all still made in China. It's just they're supposed to buy them through the U.S. companies and whatever. I don't worry about it much. $90 per camera lifetime license. Yes, the licenses are lifetime on on those, so... It's a 70 a camera for a DWD. Okay. So they're still up there. Synology's still cheaper when it comes to the per camera price. Uh, Synology's per camera price is like 40 Well, it's like $50, but when you buy four or more, it goes down to like $44. So you can look at... Their pricing is public because you can buy the licenses right on Amazon. So... ZFS for camera? Yeah, ZFS is awesome for camera if you're building your own server. Yeah, $60 a camera cheaper for the multi-pack is what uh, Kyle says. So that's that's how that works there. So yeah, it definitely, um, they, you know, and I don't, Synology and I, I know Exact Vision, and I guess someone says uh, the DW1, same thing. A lot of these companies have kind of seen a move that as a business model. They sell you a lifetime license for the camera. So as you upgrade the server, you may need certain support licenses for the server, depending on, I know Exact Vision has some of them. But the other side of that is, um, you <laughs> multi-pack. Uh, anyways, uh, you can you can transfer the licenses over. For example, if you bought a smaller Synology, but then you grew and needed more cameras, you can transfer the licenses off one Synology to the bigger Synology and then buy more licenses to facilitate that. So <clears throat> that's the nice thing is they kind of, they accumulate forward. So that's a, that's a good feature that they have. So I think... That brings us to all the things I've babbled on about. Is there something else people want me to babble on about? Look, Cloudberry backup complete. Huh. Oh, interesting. Interesting. What is this? Huntress doing its job. Neat. Cool. Anyways, thanks, Huntress. So that's why we use Huntress. I can't show you what I've seen, but I, my staff sees it, so they're going to take care of it. We still use Huntress Labs. We like them as a product. They're pretty cool. All right, back to reading things here. Uh, do I think UBNT will go bankrupt? Not at all. Not at all. UBNT's trade is a, has a market cap of over $10 billion. They're doing really, really well. They're killing it in the Wi-Fi market. Um, they are killing it in the, you know, the Wi-Fi and infrastructure stuff is absolutely going well for them. Uh, I don't see them as going bankrupt. I see them as being confused a little bit when it comes to their uh, camera systems. But bankrupt? No. No, they're they're making money, so they're they're pretty. I think they're overall a great company. The missteps at their camera are kind of well missteps at their camera system. Matter of fact, Unify Protect works really well. It's just a weird market. The fact that they went from hey we can sell you a system that does big, oh by the way we're going to discontinue it and only sell a system that's small scale, you know, and and here here's our small scale system. We're only going to do this for now. And this product was released in August or announced in August of 2019 or 2018. 
So here we are, it's taken this long for them to even mention the Dream Machine, which I'm assuming will run the Unify Protect. You can see how long it's taken them to grow this product. I think it's a cool product, but obviously it's not meant for larger enterprises. So, yeah. Um, as a small MSP, how do you deal with the challenge of needing to know a variety of different technologies in order to support your customers? Do you limit your scope to include certain vendors? Um, it's a challenge of not just being an MSP, it's a challenge of being an IT. When you work for a large company, you have to know a thing. When you work for many companies, you have to know many things. So I don't know, I think it's part of the fun of the job. It's not for everybody. Some people don't get it, you'd, you'd be correct. Some people are far from getting it. Uh, and in that case, if it's something beyond your ability to grasp or understand, then maybe you reach on, uh, reach out to some of the vendors. You find trusted partners that you can outsource to. And I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, not that I'm trying to say I know everything. For example, I talk about free PBX. I can muddle my way through it, but I don't do brand new setups on it because there's a lot of structure that needs to be done. I outsource to Crosstalk Solutions. We partner together to make things happen in the phone world with free PBX. So what you do as an MSP or just an IT vendor in general is you have trusted partners, uh, people that you know and trust, other companies that you can lean on for uh, different aspects. Um, I don't program. Matter of fact, well, until recently, we were doing web development in-house. There's another piece of expertise I just don't have a good grasp on, but now we're developing a partnership with the company that Melissa left and went to. Therefore, now we can still service our comp uh, clients and everybody wins. They get a, the other people get a new job. We get a, a commission off of the whole thing. So we're still making some money on the deal. We get a happy customer. Everybody wins. So... Yeah, this is balancing really, really well. This is a Ryzen balancer. So can we get it to balance this way? So wait, so it's gonna fall if we do that, but if we balance this, can we find, oh, look at that. It's a Ryzen, you know what? We need a whiskey glass on it, so. <laughs> there, balanced on the Ryzen here. It's a Ryzen balancer. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Like the the crosstalk is awesome for stuff like that. So we've worked working and finding your partners. It takes time to build those relationships, and you have to trust people because the people are like, oh no, they'll steal my customers. I'm like, get out of the business. If you if you think that way, um, it just isn't how people work. So open source camera software. Good luck finding some that works well. <laughs> I've seen that. I, people bring it up. There's. Uh, there's projects out there if you search, and then you'll start playing with it, and you realize that none of these projects are Maybe one day one will get well funded enough to be a really solid product, but I'm not aware of any that work really well. So, uh, do you have friends and family asking for IT help? How do you deal with it? I don't. Um, they uh, uh, friends and family get 15% off. That's what I tell them. They have to bring it to the store. I don't fix people's crap on my own. You leaving, Steve? No. Oh. No, just. Kyle's finishing something up, and I got nothing to do. I responded to a few more people in the contact form. Oh. So, no one asked me about this yet. No one asked me, and I'm ready for this question. We're, we're more ready today than we've ever been for the question that everyone likes to ask me. Besides Mikrotik, besides Mikrotik, the other question. Oh. What, what does everyone ask except for this particular episode? Here, slide in, Steve, so you're closer to the microphone. So I'm in here. focus? <laughs> yeah, see, I'm going to move the, so the mic's <laughs> pointing over here. So, hello from Sydney, Australia, and... Uh, about to turn into Linus drop tips? No, I drop things on purpose, I think. I rarely drop things by accident. Anyways, we're gonna, before we end the video today, uh, we're going to talk about OpenSense. Oh God. Yeah. So, OpenSense. Not great. Uh, <laughs> I did like that there was a search feature. That is the one redeeming quality of it because the menus made no sense. So you could actually find documentation <laughs> on the menus and it would say, well, what the setting you're looking for is here, but then you actually get into the current version, you realize, oh, they moved it. They moved it from diagnostics. They did away with that tab and you gotta go to like interfaces, WAN, ping, and so forth and so on. So they moved a bunch of stuff around and haven't updated all their documentation from what I saw. And then the other issue, I, I did like though that the menus are all, they're all nested menus on a sidebar. 
Uh, I do find that to be a little bit easier than PF Sense, though, with, with its, the top down menus. Yeah, you have like your top down menus, but then like if you click Open VPN, you have left to right menus nested within that page now. So it does get a little confusing because it's like, okay, well, I had menus here. Oh, now I'm on this page and I have menus here. Right. Um, but functionally, functionally, it, it was awful. Yeah. So we had a client who had some issues. Um, <laughs> One, we tried to turn off the open VPN service. It clearly, so he tried to reboot the service. The VPN never disconnected. I go, hold on, and I click disconnect, I click stop, go over to the computer he was testing, and I hit disconnect and reconnect. And he's like, well, that shouldn't happen. I go, oh, I agree. It says the service has stopped, but clearly it didn't. And then for some reason, it was, and I, I know of no way to change this setting and we tested it with a couple different network configurations. OpenVPN for the tunnel was binding to the first IP address of the tunnel network, as it should, and as it says it does, but it would push a route with um, the, it would push the route as the fifth IP address of that network, even if you change the network, and then it would assign the sixth IP address of the network to the client. And we just, we could change the network. We, we could delete the VPN. We could re-add the VPN. We could re-import it. And consistently it did this. The fifth IP was pushed as the route and the sixth IP was handed to the client. Well, and this is and this was the other problem. Didn't you shut off the OpenVPN server, but it kept connecting? Yeah, to yeah, the, I yeah. said that already. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we, a, we told yeah. the service stop and we could still connect. We had to reboot the whole firewall because it got order to get up. to stop. So we definitely, and, and I'm not super experienced with OpenSense. To me, it's one of those, it never offered anything that was so compelling that made me want to switch from PFSense. And the, the PFSense people just keep pumping out features and everything else. If it so, ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, that's my thing. If there's not a compelling reason to move, then why move? Like that, it, that. It, if it doesn't offer anything better, so. I didn't really see anything better. Yeah, so nothing about it. I, and matter of fact, I actually have a couple people, one of the clients we work with, he called it the dumbed down PF Sense. Uh, he tried it for a while and he had it for like a year of using it. And he's another IT person that we do business. Like we do co-managed IT with their company. So we do projects for them. And he finally switched to PF Sense. He goes, I just, he goes, I tried it. I, he loved the menu system. He, that's what he loved. Everything else he had problems with. He that, said, the so. search function was actually really nice. Yeah. You could type in OpenVPN and get all your pages of OpenVPN. And it would even break it down so you knew where they were on the side menu. So I could actually do a search and then make note of, oh, it's in this menu. Yeah. So other than he did comment that he liked the UI, but functionality, he had a lot of other problems that when he switched back to PFSense, he didn't have anymore. So it just feels like important things are missing. I like that PF Sense exposes all the detail on there. So uh, that's our thoughts on there that I wanted to share. Um, oh, it also, I don't think it has access to all the packages, so you can't get like a uh, open VPN client export from what I saw. I, I think they have their own built-in is why. They, there's something it, weird. It, it doesn't export into... Um, the same way? No, it, oh. it, it builds a certificate <clears throat> export for another VPN client. I, can't, I already forgot. Viscosity. Yeah, it has so, viscosity. Well, so does PF Sense. Well, I didn't see an option to get the client export to do the download for. You're you're going there, and they can. Yeah, I'm gonna beep. put yeah, <laughs> beat it on there now. So if we go to client export, this is the this is the 5100 sitting next to us. So like, yeah, it has it doesn't have anything like this. It only uh, go up a little bit. It actually has like a client export page built in, but none of this. Oh, you can't see where I'm pointing. Yeah, <laughs> go back down a bit. None of the um, open VPN client export that you see in the middle of the screen. It oh. actually just shows it as, and you can do exports like per user, and it gives you the user, it names it like the user, so he had the test, you know, Donald Duck. So it was like Donald, and it would give you the cert and the config, and then it was meant to be imported into Viscosity. So it has client export built in, but only for Viscosity, not a full open VPN installer from what I saw. Oh, okay, so it didn't it didn't have the Windows installer. So you still had, you'd have to go get open VPN separate versus this actually right here. Yeah. Um, is the actual installer executable? Well, bundled. then when you try to import it fails because it was designed for Viscosity. Ah, okay. And so it kinda we he actually had open VPN and we tried to do an import and it would just fail. 
It's interesting. Now, Steve also, um, in a numerous video, got it last year. Um, the, I'm not here much. He's not here much. <laughs> uh, last year, he said uh, we played with Microtech. Well, oh. That would have been earlier this year. It would have been January, probably. Yeah, I think it was. That was yeah. January. Yeah. Because that was when we were doing that project. Uh, but we, same thoughts on Microtech. Like, people like it. It's cheap. It's That's inexpensive. It. It's a ton of options. You can do whatever you want with it. It just has a steep learning curve. And it that's has my a steep learning it. curve, and there's, it takes a lot of patience to configure correctly. And it comes down to, you know, think of it like a MacBook screen replacement. Do you replace the screen behind the sealed unit, or do you replace the whole lid? You, uh, yeah, you can get the screen cheaper, but you're going to pay a small <laughs> fortune in labor versus I can buy the whole lid and slap it on in five minutes. So yeah. there, there is that difference. Of you're, you're going to spend a lot more time configuring it. And a lot of it was a little convoluted versus the Cambium stuff. I was able to do the same thing I was trying to do with the Microtech in like five minutes. Yeah, and I'm really trying to get back to reviewing some of the Cambium stuff because we really like their equipment as well. So. Yeah, the setting up the um, uh, wireless bridge with that with multi, with, and then so that you could use one of their routers to receive a wireless signal then retransmit it Which, and connect to the LAN worked really well. Um, somewhere in my forums, uh, there's I a dis- go there. No, I'm just saying, <laughs> there's a discussion. I'm, I'm trying to remember if I can find it or not. Uh, is it recent here? Right here. I And I'll bring this this one up right here. And this is you know, public in my forums here. Uh, PFSense proxy art feature configuration. This is something interesting that Microtech and PFSense support, but it's also something that I can't name that many other firewalls that do. It, it's a really interesting proxy arping problem where you have to have split networks and you want the ARP to be proxied and brought over to another segment of the network. It, I mean, these are some things that this person had configured, but had some other problems with because OpenVPN support was poor in Microtech, but he made this work in Microtech. And then at the end, we talked to uh, the discussion. Uh, so he finally has this working on PFSense using a bridge configuration. So he's happy. He was able to solve his problem and bring that over to PFSense. But that's kind of one of the things I will say, like he said, there's a lot of options in Microtech. Oh, yeah. But you then you'll do... find some of the shortcomings of lack of documentation or unclear documentation on it. And one of the reasons I like PFSense is the documentation is extensive. Extensive. The yes. forums are extensive. The PFSense book is extensive. So when you have a weird proxy ARP configuration, you can do this one-off weird... I've had odd questions yeah. about PFSense, and I'd Google it and read the manual, and I'm like, oh, that makes sense now. Yeah. I saw a bunch of traffic, and I realized, oh, the states are being created because it creates the states, seeing as Netflix traffic going out, but then all the traffic coming back in gets aggregated into that LAN out rule because that's where the state was created. Yeah. And I go, that makes sense now as to why I have so much data leaving my network. And and like uh, Drunken Slug said here, micro tick are really cheap. Those 10 gig are cheap. Yes. If oh, you yeah. just need uh, that four port 10 gig thing is pretty cool. And if you have a need to connect at 10 gig in your little home lab or some small server, cool. But... If you're looking for something that's uh, going to expand and be a lot bigger and you know, you're know you worried more about security, then you may want to go with something else. But they seem to be pretty solid. They actually seem to be fairly reliable that I know of when I've talked to people that use them. They said they, because I've talked to a couple of WISP people uh, who had a lot of their equipment. They said they, they don't have any failures. And one of the nice things when you have something inexpensive, like a 10 port switch that costs like under $200, buy two of them and yeah. now you have a backup and and those two still cost less than one of another one so and, and they're nice for wisps because once you get them going once you just keep redeploying i'm like oh let me mm-hmm. copy that image over change my two fields and away i go yeah so once you and that's actually one, what uh the client who gave us the one was looking at doing was something that could just be deployed in that fashion of once we got the initial setup I'm just going to make copies of it and then give them to people. Yeah, and someone said about the vulnerabilities there. Yes, their firewalls have had some. Yes, you can lock them down. My problem with the vulnerabilities is they were, um, what do you call it? They were- User defaults? User defaults. They could be turned off. I think turning everything off so the native out of the box, because God knows people don't always configure these stupid things. They leave them at whatever the default settings are. Uh, that's why Netgear, when you buy a new Netgear router, it has a password by default now. Yeah. So they, they made some poor choices in the past. But, hey, whatever. Uh, and that's actually a question we <clears> get <throat> a lot is, you know, people set up a PFSense and then the, can you look over this? I want to make sure it's secure. 
and that I didn't mess anything up. And they're always worried, like, out of the box, do I have to do anything with the PF sensor? Is my network just wide open? And we're like, no, there's by default a firewall rule stopping, you know, WAN in. You have to initiate a connection. What is Kyle doing that updates so fast? What? Oh. <laughs> I'm just seeing what was on the screen there. Oh, yeah, somebody clicked something. Minor. So, minor. That's why, Facebook ad. Yeah, that's why we... we uh, that's why we stay late sometimes. That's why we stay late. We have Huntress. It caught a thing. So we're going to cover more some of the processes internally on that stuff, too, for how that all works. Is there any more questions for the good of the class before we wind down here at Lawrence Systems? It is 8, 12 p.m. I've been here since 7 a.m., so I'm going That's on my... about when I left my house. Yeah, I'm ready to uh, wind down, and I want to go watch some South Park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the new episode was last night. Yeah. I realized I didn't even watch last season, so I started marathoning last season. Oh. I did watch the first few, so. I'm trying to, I think last season was all right. This season was really good so far. Uh, yeah. The last season was, I some of the scooter one was relevant, but kind of boring. Yeah. Like, I they, they were on point with all the scooters, so. I'm the, gonna, I'm, I loved the first Because we have those episode. in Detroit. Like, I absolutely uh, love the first episode Can you lock my post of on the forum? Uh, can you look at my post in a forum? I can link it. I look at all the posts in a forum, so I, I don't know the question. <laughs> I have well, not. The question is, can you look <clears throat> at it? Yeah, I will look at it. I'm not going to look at it right now. <laughs> I could. Let's briefly look at it. Did you post it under your name? Can we put it on the screen? Well, if it's in the forum, it's all public. So, uh, oh, I can answer this one if this is their question. Is this the right person? Here, let's answer a question live. I, I'll answer I right like now. this game. Yeah, I like this I like this game. A friend has been trying out XCP and just learning about creating VMs. Sounds like they've been learning about deleting them as well, which is unfortunate. <laughs> uh, one of these VMs is an old Windows 7 host uh, drive to a USB plotter. I spent hours getting USB passed through from the host. VM working, all was good. Then while they were learning, they deleted the VMs boot volume from local storage. I took snapshots, but no backups. Uh, exam storage was on the learning path. So I think they stuff, but off chance I thought I'd ask, can a VM reattach a deleted storage volume? If the data is still there, but when you delete it, it purges and coalesces the VDI chain, so not really. So uh, not really a any way to do this. Sorry. Because, and maybe and before I reply, let's see, does the crowd here uh, have a better answer? So, uh, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> I say no smart people run defaults. Well, they do. So, sorry. People run defaults all the time. Y yeah. Yeah. The, that's just the tyranny I of the default. There's people running... The, the, there's bad default creds everywhere, all right? Uh -huh. So Yeah. Uh, tips for getting an MVME detective of free NAS? I don't know. They've always detected everyone. I've tested them in. So I'm, that, I don't have a tip for it. Use an NVMe and a board compatible. Double check that you don't have a board that might shut off the NVMe if you're attaching SATA drives. We did learn that. We had a board that, that uh, when you turned on the, was it the four SATA port? Um, it had two NVMe's. One NVMe was constant. NVMe two would be shut off if SATA three was in use. Yeah, when SATA three was in use, it turned off one of the NVMe's. Yeah. That was a learning experience we had the other day. It was annoying. That was annoying. <laughs> and there's no way to find that out shy of reading the, the manual for the board. So you don't necessarily know before buying it. Well, unless you have a board in mind and you actually go and download a, cop, a PDF of the manual and then read it, there's no way of knowing off the top of your head what settings you know may, they may use for that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, if it was deleted... Uh, not just detached. So hopefully that helps. So we'll do that. Um, someone had another question here and it says, for Active Directory, do you guys use Windows or Linux? Windows. Um, experience with Azure AD, it works. <laughs> I mean, I, I I guess, I don't know if I'll do a video on it. I'm not, I don't have much passion for it. It, it works, uh, you can use it. Um, Why would I want to run AD in Linux? I don't know, I, people like that. <laughs> we don't run, we don't run AD here, so. Uh, we don't do that here, so. Um, 
Active, anything else? Anything else you go to class? Uh, some boards share PCI links. Yeah, that happens. I don't know what type of job you have, neither do I. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, Steve doesn't know what type of job he has either. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're all, all of us have the same last name here. But yeah, yes. So, so we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, we're all Lawrence. We're all Lawrence here. And in fact, if a package comes, we're all Tom Lawrence because none of us want to spell names and wait for them to type that in. Nope, nope. So we're always no matter what any package you get delivered is always signed by Tom Lawrence. Yep. We'll just throw that out there. Whether Tom Lawrence is actually here or not, he does sign for all the packages. One hundred percent. One hundred percent of them there. there. So. <laughs> yep. So uh, there, there is the claim. That's uh, all of us have the same last name as far as anyone's mm -hmm. concerned. <laughs> I don't know if there's any blood relation at all. Maybe really, really distance. I'm Indian, he's Italian. <laughs> so that's about it. Anything else? Any more questions for us? Any more Q&A before we just shut this thing down? I, I go home because I'm tired. It's, it's a long day. Yeah, and, it was. And Steve had to fix silliness first thing this morning. I told him the silliness you had to fix. Oh, it wasn't bad. The Hydrax gets stuck. It happens. Yeah, he fixed an Hydrax. Yeah. What is the black box? It's an SG5100. Rewind to the beginning of the video so you can see the I SG. I want to open it. We're opening it tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow it gets cut apart and opened. There's screws. <clears throat> There's screws in it. I think. It is. It's at the bottom. Somewhere. Um, I don't know what this is. Can you put an SD card in there? I don't know. That's why we're going to open it. We have to know these things. You can on the, uh, the Sonicle. It's oh. got an SD card slot. Oh, cool. Uh, what's for dinner? I'm eating French fries. I already ate French fries. TNSR? TNSR is vector packet routing, and I'm probably going to do a video about it at some point uh, because this will support TNSR, but I don't have a use case for it right now. And TNSR is novel. Um, it has a very specific use case for super high-end routing. So will it blend? This thing, it'd take a good blender. That is a solid heat sink on top of this, by the way. So... Mm. It's still aluminum. It's still aluminum. I mean, it'll blend. It does have a little weight to it, though. Yeah, it'll blend. Yeah. This is, you have to bring a scale on this, won't we, for the review? <laughs> I have I'm one. sure that you already see it, so rub the router. It's good luck. It I makes like a, the, I like the, I'm wondering if they do like the, uh, some of those other boxes and if they have it like attached to this via a chunk of aluminum inside to dissipate heat through the top. They have something in there that makes it chooch. I don't know. We're going to open it up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to figure it out. How they got hacked. There we go. We'll put that on there. All right. We've made it weird, which means it's time to go. So thank you for everyone who threw money at us. That will go into the whiskey fund for how they get hacked tomorrow. Please watch how they get hacked tomorrow. That will be going on tomorrow afternoon. Why after can't we buy more French fries? Fund how they got hacked with how they got hacked. We are. Well, no, they sent money here because they can't send to how they get hacked. The money here. Don't worry. We made oh. other ad revenue here that bought us French fries. Okay. So French fries to get about. So uh, we do how they get hacked on the how they got hacked channel. Um, Friday at nights. Friday nights at 730. Give or take 10 minutes plus or minus. Sometimes 720, sometimes 740. So, yes. Can the rest of us just drink on Fridays too? Yes. 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 You can drink every day. Well, there's a song about that. There, there is. There's a great <laughs> song about Every Day I'm Drinking by Little Big. Look, that's your ending suggested song for the day. Not that I even do that. Uh, but that's definitely something that's uh, a thing. It's a great song. Link to How They Got Hacked channel. If you go to the Lawrence Systems channel, it's right there, right next to at the top of the main page of the Lawrence Systems channel. Um, I could probably bring that up. So if we go here. Go to the YouTubes. Go to the YouTubes. Then we can go to how they got hacked. And then I'll drop the link over here in the YouTubes again. And whammo. Go clicky. Click and subscribe. Smash the like button. I only got 44 likes, but 152 people here. So if you guys can smash the like you button. You got to get those leave. numbers up. Got to get those amateur numbers. amateur numbers. Amateur numbers. Got to get those numbers up. So yeah, make that happen. <laughs> So hopefully that is helpful. Uh, join the How They Got Hacked. Oh, look, we see the likes going Keep up. Keep it That's going. It. Keep it going. Keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> Got to pump those numbers up. <laughs> Go up, up, up. Here. Maybe I know what we're going to do here. Before we leave, we're going to be silly. How does this work? Um. Oh, <laughs> that 
right there, right there. Make that number go higher. <laughs> it's the 58. Oh, we want to see it. So now you see, because we're looking in the screen of what we see over here. <laughs> Wait, do they see that? Yeah, well, they see what that's that's the live view. What you see on the screen is see Inception here. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Right. More dislikes coming. <laughs> yes, we're gonna have people dislike him for a long. There, about well, right there. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Make that number. That could be higher. It's right. Right there yeah. now. Right <laughs> there. There. This is hard. <laughs> this is. <laughs> oh man, let's see. Yeah, Tom's shopping channel. Oh yeah, click our click our links below. Click the affiliate links. Um, that helps the channel out. So buy our stuff. Well, some of it's not even my stuff. Buy stuff. Buy stuff. <laughs> Buy we stuff. We have our own but make stuff. Sure, but you make sure you're using links. We're working on our own stuff because we got some bad USBs coming. So we got some ideas on that. Um, you know, I got this stuff. I'm doing a video about all the stuff in my bag. So that's stuff. So do that. Um, buy, buy Kyle's stuff. Yeah. If you guys buy stuff. He designed shirts. Ky yes. Uh, Kyle designed the shirts. So. Uh, I mean. Well, yeah, he did actually design this shirt. He designed I was going to say too. not this one, but actually, yes, this one. But actually, yes, that one. <laughs> so he definitely did that. So that's a different one. So that's, uh, yeah. But you can't have this one. It's mine. That one's his, but there's more just <laughs> like it on, on the website. You can buy those. <laughs> All right, I think we did enough uh, swag selling and everything else here. So thank you for coming. Thank you for dropping by. Uh, look for more videos and some reviews of this uh, PF Sense stuff sitting in front of us soon. I think that's how this works. I don't know. Fine, nice. Good. Uh, yep. All right. You <laughs> want to press the button? Usually Xavier presses that button, the spinny button. Why does it do? You, that makes it 